preeminent computer vision scientist. In fact, if in your own institution you know some computer vision people, chances are they're either Jitendra students or students of students or students of students of students, uh, myself included. Uh, and uh, uh, so Jitendra uh, is uh, uh, has been, you know, working on vision for 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 a very long time. And recently, he's thought, ah, vision too easy. Let's do the real hard stuff is robotics. And so today he will tell us about, about how, how language is not enough and even vision is not enough. Okay, so uh, let me start. So uh, since LLMs have been advocated as solutions to AGI, and I find the term AGI itself a very problematic concept which will become clearer later. Uh, let's start by understanding something about artificial intelligence. Before we understand artificial intelligence, let's understand natural intelligence. And uh, natural intelligence is a biological construct, and everything in biology only makes sense in the context of evolution. So the beginnings of intelligence are like 540 million years ago in the Cambrian explosion, which is when you have the first multicellular animals, and these animals could see and they could move. And this, these two abilities go together because the ability to move means that you can get food in different places, but then you need to know where to go, which means that you need some form of perception. So this is a loop, perception and motion together. And there are zillions of books on this theme that this is what sparked off uh, evolution in a very big way. So how a variety of the phyla developed. And there's a line from Gibson, we see in order to move and we move in order to see. So one little example. Predator and prey relationship cause an evolutionary arms race. And, and that's very related to this, right? So if there's a prey, they will evolve camouflage. A predator will try to detect the prey in spite of the camouflage. The prey will try to move away. Then the predator has to move faster to, to, to catch the prey and so on and so forth. Okay, there's a very long history there, uh, which I will not recap. But if you move to the hominid line, something like the last five... Uh, seven million years ago, you have the development of bipedalism. Instead of four legs, we were walking on two legs and our hands were free, which enabled tool making. And, uh, and that is an, there's an interesting uh, story there, which is that the development of the brain follows the development of the hand. Because the, with the hand, you could make tools which gave an incentive for sort of uh, problem solving and, uh, and, and modifying your environment in various ways. And uh, I don't mean to imply that this is the only branch of intelligence. There are The octopus is an equally valid branch of intelligence and many others. Their evolution should not be thought of as in this uh, sense of scale of nature, that there is one line where which culminates with humans above whom there are angels and above whom there is God. Okay, this is, this is nonsense. It's really like a bush spreading out in many different directions. Anyway, in the human line, in the last... Uh, you have the modern humans coming out of Africa somewhere around there, and then they very likely already had language and symbolic thinking. So if you think of evolution and the development of intelligence as spanning 24 hours, language the last one or two or three minutes of that. Okay. So therefore, there has to that has to just instinctively make you cautious of a theory which says that all of intelligence resides in those last two or three minutes. There are continuity arguments that you can make here, right? And actually, there was a slide in the previous talk, sort of in the beginning, which said that language is an ability which humans have. It's uniquely human. But it comes in the context of all these other abilities, which are pretty similar between us and primates and, and everybody else. The brain of a primate, the visual area, the motor cortex, they're very similar to what, what we have. They are in the same places, similar structure, et cetera, et cetera. All these findings were done initially on primates and then repeated on humans. So that's, that, that's the core of my argument. So, in, okay. Now let's contrast this with this fact that we've had incredible success with large language models, right? And it, you can't open the newspaper without reading all about this. And what I want to contrast this with is, uh, is, uh, is that we, there are certain abilities we still don't have. I mean, we kind of are, 
Are we kind of have it? I mean, maybe in a couple of years it'll be there, but we have had this era of, you know, this is an Elon Musk quote from 2019 uh, that we will have million taxis in the next year and so on. The, the, the short summary I would say is that the ability, self-driving cars, which a 16-year-old can do in like 20 hours of training, right? That has proved to be very, very hard for machines to recapitulate. Whereas the law exam, right? Uh, the law exam is at, at the 90 percentile. So there's something which is jarring about this. And let me make it even more extreme. So here's a set of tasks I picked. There's a set of verbs which correspond to activities that you can do in a kitchen. And a 12-year-old can probably do all of these. Okay, and no robot can today. No single robot can do all of these tasks. And this is, of course, well-known in AI. Uh, not, but somehow, surprisingly, not in the popular media. I do not read all these articles that I read in the New York Times and Washington Post. They do not talk about this. In the AI literature, this is called Moravec's paradox. And Moravec said it in a certain way, which is it's comparatively easy to make computers exhibit adult level performance on intelligence tests or playing checkers, but difficult to have the skills of a one year old. I think Pinker said it more pithily, because Pinker does say everything more pithily. The hard problems are easy, and the easy problems are hard. Okay, and the gardeners, receptionists, and cooks are secure in their jobs for days to come for years, decades to come. So I believe this to be true. And, uh, but now we need to get in a bit underneath. What does this mean? Why, why is this? And uh, Morovic's argument, I, I think, was slightly flawed. Morovic's original argument was that what we have, what we are trying to do in AI is reverse engineering. And if we are trying to reverse engineer, then the abilities which are much older in evolution will be harder to reverse engineer. And that is a valid description of the paradigm as existed, you know, decades ago. But that's not the paradigm today. The paradigm today is that we are not relying on our ingenuity. We are relying on data. The data has the ingenuity. So therefore, the question must be about what data is available. And it is in data that we find that uh, language sort of, uh, the language folks, like my friends here, like Chris Manning and Yejin, they have lucked out. Because all of language, so much of language is available on the web, right? Every, everything is, has been put up on the web. And then it, you can, you know, everything from Reddit and, uh, uh, you know, books and uh, everything. Uh, Wikipedia, it's all there. And so you can start from that. Now, if you think about the sensory motor experience, the equivalent of that is uploading what, when I go about my daily activity, I, I see something, I it activate, and I, some muscles are activated. So the right counterpart would be my sensory motor record uploaded to the web, and for all of humanity. If we had that, then we would have the kind of counterpart of this data. But this is not feasible. This is not happening, right? We will, we would never consent to that in any case. So, somebody had a question, huh? YouTube has a part of the data. YouTube has the, the uh, some, uh, it doesn't give you the full sensory motor experience because you might, you, you see, but you do not know the, the muscle activation, for example, of the people. Fair enough. Yeah, but, but, but a bigger part is missing, I would argue. Okay, but anyway, we can debate that. Yeah. So, uh, so, so anyway, I, I will argue that the available digitized data on the web is, is, is largely missing. And uh, so anyway, that's one remark. Uh, then, uh, then I want to get into a little bit into robotics and what makes robotics hard. Because it's not the same way in which other tasks are hard. So this is a robot which we have, which we build in our group. And uh, here it is on, in a rocky area. And this is uh, the, the, and this is this on, and it's a blind robot, by the way. And more examples. And now, of course, you will say that this, this is, uh, you'll see, you've seen lots of examples of this from the Boston Dynamics people who upload YouTube videos. But what is not said is that 
they design specific controllers for situations. So one controller for climbing stairs and another controller for descending stairs, for example. I, I may be literally be wrong on that, but in, in general, the, the, that's the style. And uh, whereas uh, here, everything that I've shown you corresponds to one policy in all situations. And it's a blind robot. So I want to use this to make some historical remarks. But first, let's think about pattern recognition versus uh, control theory. So pattern recognition uh, was a kind of this area which was in the 1950s equally prominent as symbolic AI. Then what happened is that symbolic AI took off, at least in computer science departments, and pattern recognition was the, the poor cousin hanging around in E departments and stat departments by and large. But what they emphasized was generalization as the central problem. In control, you need, what is generalization? You need two things. You need robustness to disturbances, and you need adaptation to varying physical conditions. So this adaptation is a counter counterpart of generalization. You need the robot to walk in all these different conditions. And, and an example of that is that in this picture where there is one policy which walk, uh, walks in all of these situations. Okay, another historical remark. The 1950s and were, were a very fervent period where for, uh, lots, lots and lots of stuff happened because it's like the post-war uh, computers emerged. There was a lot of interdisciplinary communication because in, during World War II, teams were set up which were interdisciplinary in nature. So you had essentially uh, many of these ideas which are from the late 50s or early 60s. And there is, the I, I haven't listed sort of symbolic AI where they asserted certain theses which have turned out to be, I think, quite misguided. For example, the symbol system hypothesis of Newell and Simon. You should read Newell and Simon's uh, Turing Award lecture, which if you read today in the light of what we know about word to work and so on, it just seems wrong. Whereas when I was a kid, when I read it, I said, oh, of course they are right. And that was the, the logic which led down the path of, of uh, uh, classical AI. The control theory people never believed in this. Control theory people believe in equations like that, where x is a vector and a is a matrix. Now, the limitations there are, of course, that it's all linear, because in the linear setting, you can do things analytically and work things out. Now, uh, what I'm talking about in the classical framework can be seen very easily, because this is the dynamics of a system. x is a state vector, which captures classically in physics its position and momentum and stuff like that. And A is uh, capturing the dynamics, how, how it changes over time. And, uh, but this is a linear story, right? And this A, so in a classical control theory setup, this A is a constant, which is known, which is called systems identification, finding that out. And then you, and then you can work, out, uh, work things out on paper and then implement it on a computer. And this is great. This is what took man to the moon. The Apollo mission would have failed if you didn't have the ability to stabilized trajectories and so forth. But today what we can do with deep learning is that we can just do everything, allow everything to be nonlinear, which is a very, very big and powerful thing. And what we do is that we allow this A also to be changing, which is what you have to do for all this, uh, these different terrains, for example. And that's, that's what uh, deep learning gives, for, gives us. It takes the classical control theory way of thinking and combines it with this power of uh, you know, what we have to do is combine that with the power of deep learning. Okay. So, so now I'll, I'll take you through. So now, uh, okay. Uh, now let's talk about big data. So the success of, uh, success of LLMs is, is like, it's due to three different parts. One part are these, the, the, the power of SGD, if you will, right? One part of it is uh, the availability of hardware, but a very important part of it is data, which as I said, I mean, for language people, all the data is available on the web. So now if we want to apply that magic, okay, of sort of algorithms, data, and compute, then where is the data going to come from, okay? Now here, typically, if you think about any robotics task, they, 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 the most natural mapping is to reinforcement learning. 
uh, sorry. So, uh, I mean, uh, in fact, optimal control, uh, there's a classical setup of optimal control where you have a known dynamics and then you have some cost function which is try which you're trying to optimize. So the cost function in the setting might be you want to minimize your energy and you want to walk uh, as long as possible, right? I mean, these are, this is a typical setup and, uh, right? Now, uh, that is actually totally connected to reinforcement learning because reinforcement learning is also an optimal control setup. It's just being optimized in a different way. So the classical control theory people will write down the model and analytically work out the optimal solution. Reinforcement learning is a way of solving that same, for minimizing that same cost function, but using basically fancy trial and error. Okay, now what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that you takes a very large number of trials. And when you have a physical robot, you can't do that very large number of trials. So what are the early successes of RL? If you see uh, DeepMind, what did DeepMind become famous for? The big success, by deep learning took off, I mean, for some people with success in vision, but for some people with success at Go. Why? What's so unique about Go? Well, because you can play it in a simulator. Because you can play it in a simulator and you can do the billion trials and it's no problem. When you do a billion trials of a real robot, you are going to have to deal with wear and tear and all the rest of it and it's not going to work so well. So, so this is to me the central problem. Reinforcement learning is a very natural tool to use, but reinforcement learning, given the algorithms we have today, uh, when applied on physical systems is, is problematic. Now, this, this is where we are lucky in the context of language because the humans manage to learn with, I mean, the same is true for human learning or motor acts as it is for language. Humans are much more efficient learners. A human baby, a, Here's maybe a th million words a month. That's the estimate that I've read, which is very small. So at the age of 10, uh, how much would that be? That would be 100 million, right? Well, clearly our language models are trained with much more than that. So our language models are, are able to get away with inefficiency in learning. Now, the same we have the same inefficiency in terms of human babies learning versus our machines learning, but we can't deal with that wear and tear. Yeah, wish. Very high. I will. That that is actually uh, half my talk. So so from now on, since Umesh asked the right question, I did I didn't set him up for this. Uh, basically, pa half my talk is: Can we make this work in simulation? And I'll show you ways of doing that. And my the other half of my talk is: What if it's not possible to do it in simulation? Then we have to try to make a learning process more efficient, the way human learning is more efficient. And those are the two strategies. And uh, I am thoroughly opportunistic and I'm trying both. Yeah. So, so now I'll, I'll tell you the, the, the simulation version. So this is the first half of the talk, which is, so we have, uh, and the, the, the high level summary is we developed this uh, recipe called rapid motor adaptation. And I'll abbreviate it as RMA. And this is a trick that we have which enables us to train in simulation and then transfer to the real world. And we have used this trick like three or four times. It's not an algorithm, but like a meta trick. So the way you can think of dynamic programming is not a specific algorithm, but like a template with which you can design algorithms in different settings. So this RMA is that. And I'll give you examples of that. Then the next half of my talk is going to be how to learn from data in the real world. And that's where actually there are good analogies with uh, counterparts of the techniques which have been found worthwhile for language models. So let me give you like the, the, the two minute version of this RMA metric. Uh, so, uh, so this is what we want eventually. So we want, uh, so the policy, the, the policy is your controller, which outputs an action A and it is given as input the state. So the state for a robot might be the joint angles of every uh, of, of the legs of the robot and so on. A of t minus one is the action at the previous state. And uh, so this is not, this is some nonlinear box. It's some neural network which outputs the action, which is desired joints and so forth, 
right? This is going to be trained in some way. Very importantly, there is this variable z. And this z is some latent which captures the environment. So are you walking on sand? Are you walking upstairs? Are you walking downstairs? Things like that. Okay. And so the idea is that you make the policy depend not just on the state, but also on this variable z, which captures aspects of the environment. So in a linear system, this would be complicated. But in a nonlinear system, this information can be used to essentially change the equivalent of that matrix A because of this Z. And then the problem is that we don't know what Z is, right? So the Z, Z is, in, in our, by the way, it's like a low dimensional vector for us. It's like eight dimensional or something like that. And this has to be estimated. And, and this is the, the clever part is this that the z itself can be estimated by another uh, neural network which is operating at some meta level. And the intuition is something like this. I, let's say I'm, I'm walking, so I, I walk. So I, I, I move my, my legs and feet and so forth. And I issue a set of commands and then there are the consequences of that which are being sensed. Now, if I'm walking on hard ground, when I lift up my foot with the same force, something happens. If I'm walking in sand, I'm walking now on a beach, I lift up my foot with the same force, something different happens. It lifts up only partially, right? So that means that how my body reacts to the same sequence of commands reflects something about the environment. So it is revealed by, by, by what happens. So, so now you imagine that I have, if I have my temporal history, a history of states and actions over the last so many time steps, then that has the information which reveals what conditions you are in. And, and that's what this adaptation module does. It takes that as input and it tries to estimate the z vector. Okay. So that's the intuition of how it works. What I haven't told you is the the operationalization of this idea. How do I train this? How do I train this? But this is, if you will, technical detail. But but the conceptual system is, I think, super simple. Yeah. Does X uh, have both the state of the environment and the robot? So X is what you can sense from the robot. So it's in this case, it's uh, is joint angles. Okay, I see. Yeah. So so you the, the assumption is you know X. Uh, yeah, the X is what is known. X, X is exactly what you know. Z is the part that is unknown. Yeah. So, so there are alternative ways of thinking about this, right? So there is. So uh, another way you could do is to put x and z together into some new x prime, and then you would set up the problem as a partially observable Markov decision process and so on. That those methods will end up being totally in, intractable. Form DPs is an area which the, the wise thing is don't go there. Okay. <laughs> assumption is if you knew z exactly okay then you would know what the right action to do is so that's yeah. the, or the base the baseline is human so human knows the environment knows the state they're in and yeah they i mean the human may not consciously know it right, but right, implicitly right, right. No, you know, it. know in any yeah. in the sense that the next step i make that's the right step yes. and you're trying to get to that correct correct, correct. yeah so the, so essentially you can think of it as a fully observable situation where you would know the z and we, we can create, we actually train in simulation with that. And then we train a separate estimator for estimating Z. And that's not going to be perfect. It's going to be noisy. It's not going to be the exact ground truth. But assuming suitable continuity conditions, if it's approximately right, the policy will be approximately right. And always you are measuring and you are in a feedback loop. So therefore, you can always correct for any error. Can you feed Z also into the adaptation model? Yeah, I mean, the adaptation model internally always knows Z because it's a recurrent network. Yeah. Okay. And and, uh, and that's it. Uh, by the way, this is, this is uh, so we have this, this thing we came up with, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, and now we have milked it in different settings. And uh, so the, the basic setup, so here's a, by the way, a, cool, a, a little example. So this is, uh, uh, so this is, uh, 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 we are, okay, this is Ashish that you don't see, but you see him pouring olive oil. 
this was during the pandemic. So I told him, take the robot home and work on it. So he used to sleep with the robot next to him and led to extreme productivity. OK, so uh, so there is uh, olive oil on this uh, on this uh, uh, carpet. And now this robot is going to try to walk. And he makes it actually hard by putting some plastic on the socks on the robot. And then the robot tries to walk. OK. So what did you see? You should see it sort of uh, suffering a little bit. Let's do it in slow-mo. OK, so now let's describe this. So what happened was it was it had parameters corresponding to walking on hard ground. It starts to walk on this slippery thing, so some friction coefficients are different. And now what's happened is that it's, so it's messed up. It's not able to walk. And if it continued like that, it would fall. But what, so what's happened is in our language, the Z has changed. And, uh, and what has to happen is that the estimator for Z has somehow got to get the new estimate of Z. And once the new estimate of Z is fed into the policy, the right things will happen. And let's see what happens here. So here you will see it walking. And so Z is an h-dimensional vector, but Z1 and Z5 are, are shown here. And, what you, and uh, at the top, you have sort of right, rear, front, left, and so on. So those correspond to which legs of the robot are on the ground. And as the robot moves, you will see uh, you will see what's happening. So it's uh, so it's stumbling, and then because it has the wrong z values, and then once the z values are estimated to be correct, then the policy changes and it can it can work. Okay. And uh, okay. And then uh, okay, fine. This this example is clear. I want to tell you something which I like about reinforcement learning, which I, which I, I think are these are arguments that the deep mind people used to make, and uh, uh, and which is different from the the benefits of just generic uh, supervised learning, which is the ability to discover things that the the people hadn't thought of. Okay, so emergence, and now emergence is a very fraught term. But in reinforcement learning, what happens is that you're doing a lot of trial and error under some rules of the game. But with that trial and error, strategies can emerge that a human player may not have thought of. I mean, that's been true in Go and so forth. But in this setting, what, like the, the, if, if you were Boston Dynamics designing a controller, you would design a controller for a robot for, for walking versus trotting versus galloping. Each of them would have a separate control law because the differential equations which govern the dynamics change depending on the nature of contact. In this case, what we do is we just specify a term in the loss function, which says uh, 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 this is the desired speed at which you go. So when the desired speed is relatively low, 0.375 meters per second, this is the gate that emerges. OK. OK. And then, uh, sorry. Uh, let you, let, let's keep playing that. The volume. Okay, and now if I say give it a more des higher desired speed, then if you notice the footfall pattern has changed. Okay, I did not program this in. I mean, all the, all the robot is told is conserve energy and move forward. And then if you give it your even higher desired velocity, then these different speeds emerge. This I would count as a genuine emergence phenomena. And it is a simple explanation for it. Energetics, and this people in biomechanics knew. At low speeds, walking is more energy efficient. At high speeds, running is more efficient. For a horse, you have a variety of gates. And, and, and these curves sort of basically say that, and that's what you get. OK, so let's continue with this template of walking. So far, I did blind walking. And blind people can walk perfectly well. So that's why you must start with that. But what do you need vision for? OK, if I have to cross a river on stepping stones, I better have uh, it's, it's good to have, have vision. And then, of course, in more difficult conditions like stairs and so forth. And, uh, and so this is, uh, this is another paper, which is going to try to use that same template. OK? And uh, here is the idea. So now we have our robot, and it's got a camera on top. 
And this camera sees the depth in front of it. And that's the image of the depth in front of it. And uh, we are trying to train a policy for it. And this policy is going to have some Z, which is a measure of the environment. And then this gamma, this gamma is some measure of the geometry of the environment in front of it. So again, the geometry, you do not need a detailed geometry everywhere. What you want to do is to compress the geometry into the most, into a relatively small vector. And that vector is gamma, gamma for G for geometry, right? And uh, which come, okay. And basically now you have these two latent vectors which capture, one which is capturing things like friction and so forth, and one which is capturing things like some aspect of the geometry. And uh, and then let's, and that's, and, and again, I'm skipping the details underneath the hood, but the high level story is quite simple. And and now this is where, this is what, uh, this is what we can do. So there is a camera on top of, this is what the camera sees. And it knows nothing about the environment. So the environment is, is, uh, is, you just put some obstacles in front of it or these tools and it has to work. So as you can see, it is uh, Ashish's apartment. This is Rose Garden, right? Yeah. And, and uh, so one thing worth, worth commenting on, uh, because sometimes people do this by imitation of human movement patterns, that wouldn't work because the steps are actually quite high for, the, for this, essentially this dog, right? And uh, so the strategy develops is one where it sort of the rear, rear leg is sort of pull, put out to the right, kind of like hurdles. When you see humans running hurdles, there's an aspect of this. So the... So here it's suffering, but it manages to make it. Okay, and then this is in, uh, in at CMU because we wanted to prove that it didn't work only in Berkeley. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, anyway, so so this is. The, uh, uh, okay, I'm good. Okay, so now uh, I, I want to show where this, uh, so what are the hidden assumptions here? So basically, is robotics solved? Can I just turn the crank on this? No, it's not. And the, the challenge here is we need to build simulators which are good enough. And that has proved to be quite a challenge. And uh, the simulator doesn't have to be perfect because uh, this, this adaptation process which deals for variation from one real world condition to another also deals with the variation from the simulator to the real world. See, for a physicist, these are all solved problems, but there are unknowns like you don't know the friction, you don't know the characteristics of the granular medium and so forth. So in theory, Newton's laws deal with everything, but in practice, uh, implementing them means that you need to know all these parameters that you don't know. Okay, so what we did was we said, let's take a task which is representative of uh, dexterous manipulation. So dexterous manipulation is how you can use your hands to uh, manipulate objects. Okay, uh, so like rotating an object in the hand. Okay, and then this is that task. So generalization here means that you are rotating different objects of differing mass and so on and so forth. And this is rotation about the z-axis. So again, the approach is you train in simulation. So you're training in simulation with like a billion trials. And then after that, you put it out in the real world. And these are the results. And this shows what, uh, what this is. Okay. So there's a lot of variation because some objects are light, some are heavy, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, this is a task that humans can do quite well. I mean, it's easy. But by the way, a one-year-old couldn't do it, right? It takes uh, some skill. Uh, okay, now we took a version of this task, which I think is hard even for humans. And this is uh, try to do the task for an arbitrary axis of rotation. So rotating about the Z axis is easy because essentially your fingers are holding up the object. Rotating about like the X axis or Y axis or some arbitrary unit vector is more challenging because, uh, I mean, just try it. I think if you try to rotate about uh, X or Y axis, so Z is vertical here, 
and x and y are two arbitrary directions of the plane just try doing it yourself you'll find that it's not easy okay and when we did this we interestingly what we found was so this is that paper we found that uh, we could not do it blind so the previous task demos you saw were all blind but if you do want to do a harder task so this is a good story which is that when you walk in easy terrain you can you don't need vision but when you need walk in hard terrain you need vision here when you're trying to do the more difficult rotation task you need full sensing and sensing means vision and obviously touch what you have in your fingers and uh, and here is the the final proof uh, let me see if this works so here okay there is an axis of rotation which is listed so anyway there is a cartesian product here of different axes of rotation and different objects and and it uh, it okay you can see what it does and uh, Okay, machinery, the details don't matter. The main point is, again, the same high-level template of RMA works, which is you use your sensing to over a longer time interval to estimate some aspects of this Z vector. And, and by the way, there's a little uh, uh, observation here that there are two different time scales involved. There's a time scale at which you're moving all your joints and then there's a time scale at which you're adapting and that adapting is over a slower time scale and it works because we don't fall instantly instantaneously see if i'm falling and now let's let me do if it's something which i didn't expect i will stumble and that stumble is like half a second worth and if i can recover in that half a second i'm okay and that that is basically what is going on in these things there is a, a fast time scale at which you move your joints and there is a slower time scale at which you adapt. And so long as you have that leeway, you are good. Okay. And, and uh, there are some things which, so we get this very pretty result, which is that blind, the performance is like this. And uh, this is when you have full ground truth. And just touch uh, is uh, just, uh, okay, one of these is just vision. One of these is just touch. And this is vision and touch. I have a question yeah. related to what you said earlier, which is um, when, you, when you showed us the videos of the dog moving uh, across various obstacles and so on. Uh, so, um, is it uh, you know is it that adaptive me mechanism that you described, or is it that um, if it comes to a to a place where it might fall off, that that it does it does best effort, or does it actually stop and say, well, can't do. It? Uh, it, it it doesn't say it, I can't do it because it, because it's been uh, because the cost function that it has is trying to always <laughs> keep it moving. The cost function is always try to move. Right. Is it much harder if you try to put in a cost function where you say, well, no, 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 that's uh, that, that's like one uh, layer above. I haven't shown you some. We have some recent results where we we now took the, this dog and we put a strategic behavior like game theory. So pursuit evasion games. So you have one robot which is trying to chase another robot, and then you get in more intelligent behavior. So the best way to think about it is that there are layers of behavior. Okay. I have a confidence score and saying that I'm not very sure to go this path, therefore I can ask some expert advice. It can do that. I mean, that can be put in. Yeah, we just didn't have that for this experiment. Okay. So I'll, I'll skip this part, but basically it says that it works. It, that that using more senses is good, which is by the way interesting because uh, I feel that robotics is uh, is a field which is quite behind computer vision and quite behind natural language. Okay, I I think I can say this even in the presence of robotics people, it feels like it's ten years behind or twenty years behind. Okay, uh, so my simple argument is just look at the hardware. In computer vision, I started in computer vision and robotics in the early eighties. And my advisor used to advise both robotics and vision students. And the vision people, we were str struggling with three images, which were like of low resolution. And that's all we had in the lab. And that's all we ran all our algorithms from. And today, there are a trillion photos on the web, or maybe more. OK? Uh, at that time, the robotics people had a robot arm. And it was equipped with a parallel jaw gripper. And you go to my colleague's lab today, and they have a robot arm which is equipped with a parallel jaw gripper. So, okay. So uh, uh, now it's not completely true because you have some multi-fingered hands, but I believe that 
until you, you we, we really do need the right hardware, which is the argument for embodiment. So I think my earliest first slide, I was arguing that language is kind of this disembodied thing, which in real animals or real humans builds on top of all this layer of embodiment, right? And anyway, that is my, my uh, position that uh, you need physical intelligence on top of which to, to develop the symbolic intelligence. And if you develop a purely symbolic, linguistically based intelligence, it is a valid intelligence, right? It's fine. I'm not going to go into debates on do these LLMs, are they stochastic parrots or intelligent? That's a debate which is of, to me, no value. But it is a certain weird alien intelligence. That's all. Like if I want an intelligence which is closer to humans, because that's the kind of intelligence that I want in my home robot, I will want it to be based on where the, 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 the linguist ability is connected with grounding. Okay, now, uh, okay, I have 20 minutes. Uh, now, the second part of my talk, uh, less, yeah. Uh, the, the second part of my talk is, I made up this story using simulation, and this works for settings where you have simulation. Now, this is not a model for real, uh, how children learn. Because children learn, do not need a billion trans. Now, I think that in the language case, they have said, who cares, and just, They've gone ahead with it. I feel that that I that I I, I really want to bet on uh, nature. I, I feel that the recipe that nature evolved is actually a good one to learn on. But it was not me who thought of this first. The person who thought of it first was actually Alan Turing. That same famous paper of 1950, which proposed the Turing test. If you take the trouble to read all the way to section five or section six, you have this paragraph. Instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one which simulates the child's? If this were then subjected to an appropriate course of education, one would obtain the adult brain. So Turing said this, and it's uh, brilliant. It's like, a, yeah. But you could push it further and say, instead of doing the, uh, you know, a, a dog, <laughs> human child, why not do a, you know, a dog or a cat child? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that those are all research agendas one can pursue. Uh, yeah. So now the difference is, so Turing said this paper is 1950 uh, and today is 2023. The, what is the difference? What has changed in the last 70 years? Obviously, computers have got much faster and so on. But to me, one very interesting point is our colleagues in psychology have not been have been active and they've, they've done a lot of research on how children learn. And, uh, and, 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 and this is something that we can draw on today, which Turing obviously would have had no idea at that time. I mean, there were people like Piaget who had already written stuff on child development, but basically not much was known. But now, 70 years later, a lot is known. For example, we know that the, the, like a, this child in the crib is interacting with objects in a very multimodal way. There is touch, there is sight, there is sound, and then there, the, 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 uh, Alison, uh, Alison Gopnik, who is a colleague in psychology, she has this book, uh, the title of which is The Scientist in the Crib. And uh, one of her points is that the kid, when the kid is, you know, when your a toddler is in a, a high chair and throwing stuff down, you shouldn't feel upset. The, 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 the toddler is really a scientist carrying out experiments through which she is uh, building a model of the world. And, these, and, and the beauty is that this is a controlled experiment because you supply the controlled input and then you get the consequences of that. So you get to build a causal model. Uh, and then this child, when you take, when, when, when this mom is taking the child to the zoo at the age of two, then one example of a zebra is enough. But it's because in this early stage, the child has built models of the three-dimensional world is build models of how objects look like from different points of view, models of physics, how do different materials interact, models of social interaction and behavior, and so on and so forth. It has a very, very rich uh, set of capabilities, okay? And, 
and then there so so i mean this is a huge literature thousands of papers have been written on it i like this one review paper by linda smith and michael gasser linda smith is a professor at indiana and uh, they have tried to boil it down to some six principles of childhood learning and uh, one is multimodality so the use of uh, different uh, senses all at the same time incremental so there are stages of learning so here's an here's what we know when a, a child is born what does the child look at most preferentially turns out the child looks at faces then after that the child looks at hands then after that the child looks at other objects okay there are very very distinct stages of sort of evolution of what the child is interested in doing okay there are stages in terms of motor actions there are stages in terms of language so in language there is a stage where the it's the child works with triplets or you know subject verb object kind of triplets then so on there is a stage the, when the, the the words are very concrete they there are the sensory motor programs are being learned by trial and error there is a stage when the child goes to school and then starts reading books and then is essentially acquiring the meanings of words by completing missing words and that's a very important stage but it is a stage which comes at the end of this process and when we do llms now i'm going to philosophize for sure uh, when we do llms we're just totally turning this backwards llms are doing that last stage without doing the early stages and now they can do much more than what a human does because no human reads uh, as much information as 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 is available on the web so that's why my i i want to call it an alien intelligence which is not a human intelligence it's an alien intelligence and i don't want to argue about the word intelligence because to me an octopus has a valid intelligence mode and uh, and a crow crows by the way are very clever there are all these experiments on uh, new caledonian crows solving problems octopuses again you can read that there there's a book uh, there are many books on this octopuses are like the the new animal uh, fashionable animal to study uh, there are books on cognition in animals and in my mind there's a continuity between animal intelligences and human intelligences language is a discontinuity so picking language is the model of of uh, of intelligence this is wrong this is something just fundamentally inept about it i'm not trying to say language is unimportant language is very important it's uniquely human but don't make that the model of intelligence because that is the one discontinuity with respect to all the n minus 1 species that we have okay it's useful but it is not that now let me rant on why agi is such a stupid term agi is an implication and and i agi is an implication that there is one agi one unique dimension of problem solving ability or intelligence no again if you think about intelligence it's like a bush or a shrub and there are many branches which have developed so like the octopus has like 500 million neurons it's an amazingly intelligent character uh, animal with a very distributed intelligence a lot of the intelligence is in each of the arms of the octopus okay it's a very uh, as opposed to a more centralized system like ours is it not a valid intelligence it's a valid intelligence so the term general with intelligence it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a wrong thing to do there are specific intelligences the octopus's intelligence is important the crow's intelligence is important the human's intelligence is important the kinds of assistance that i want in my home would have been built up on this kind of a structure and then i would be in a much more sympathetic situation with it i will use gpt4 it is an alien intelligence and it's good for correcting my essays or whatever but fine use it whichever way you like do not put it on the pedestal in the way in medieval christian method there was a scale of nature which started with plants actually they, i i forgot that diagram where rocks were at the bottom and then plants then animals then man then angels then god okay this is bullshit this is not the way you should think about intelligence okay enough of this rant i have i'll use 5 minutes for some other examples uh so so now i'll show you um uh, some results which are in the nature of 
how do we try to manage with the the the, the big sample complexity limitations that you will have if you are trying to develop intelligence with these human constraints so the sample complexity for a child is 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 a, a much bigger constraint than it is for a uh, computer programming simulation so uh, i'll give you one example which is uh, we have this paper which is trying to do cross modal supervision so here's this robot and i want to make it learn to walk using vision but i don't want to uh, to do it in simulation so here is a note. When this robot is, is on the stairs, then if I calculate from the kinematics, the, the lengths of the various legs and the joint angles and simple trigonometry, you can figure out the heights of every point, right? With the information that is accessible to this animal. So what that says is that, and, and what do I want vision to do? I want vision to tell me the, the, the depth in front of me because I want to climb up stairs and so on. So it turns out that what you can do is you can, uh, yeah. So so here's an example of what our system at work. So it starts learning while walking, and first day it's not so good. Second day is better, and the third day is much more uh, successful. Okay. So now, what was the secret? Okay, so the secret was this. So the proprioceptive system, the system of joint angles gives me an estimate of the depth over time, right? As I'm walking, now I know what my, where my feet are. And what my vision system does is, is that uh, I want vision to give me a prediction in advance, one second in advance. So what you need to do is to just take the visual stream and the and the proprioceptive stream, just shift them in time and train the vision system to predict what the proprioception will, will measure one second later. So you've got self-supervision. Nobody, you don't need an external supervision. One modality is supervising the other modality. And this works, basically. That's what we showed. And then the beauty is that you have lifelong learning. So here is this robot. And what we did was we messed up its, its, uh, its camera system. So it's going to suffer initially. Okay, anyway, I, I, uh, and then and then it becomes, uh, okay, let's see if I, so it's not adapted, so therefore it's, the system is messed up. It's like if I took your eyes and I rotated them by 30 degrees. But as it walks, it's getting the correct data, which does the calibration. Okay. Okay, so now let's show you what happens after one minute of training data. So this is a well-known phenomena in humans. It's called prism adaptation. You can take a prism and put it in front of one of the eyes and all the rays will be deviated by 10 degrees. And if you try to reach an object, you fail, but you keep doing it for a bit and you adapt. Okay, I'll give you another example. Uh, so this is, okay, I'm now out of time. So I'll conclude in three minutes. So this is, uh, okay, blah, 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 let's skip all this. Okay, so I wanted to give you a flavor of something which is very, uh, uh, LLM-ish, which is uh, how, that uh, how do I train a vision system which will work for many tasks? And uh, so that's the goal. I want to do various tasks and instead of having a, a, a separate vision system for every task, I want uh, one vision system for many tasks. And, uh, and this is the, the, the idea of this uh, paper led by Ilya Radashovic. And uh, and the idea is that we train a vision system by a self-supervised objective with what's called masked autoencoder. So suppose here's an image. And what I do is I delete patches from the image. And then you give the computer the remaining patches and you ask it to fill in the rest. So this is exactly the moral equivalent of you delete a word and you try to fill it in. So you might say, oh, the vision people are learning from language. But no. Actually, Alyosha had a paper on this like in uh, 2015 or 2016. I will say the language people are learning from vision. Of course, that's not correct because there was this idea of the closer task, which goes back to the 50s and 60s. So we can go on forever. But it's a really a very good idea of uh, filling in missing words. But this idea works in the context of vision as well. And with this, 
so this is like the, the so this is a self uh, self supervision via master auto encoder blah 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 okay delete all this okay it works okay <laughs> second story is can we apply this for a robotic task and this is a very recent paper we've just put it out on archive so here what we do is we have a robot uh, now you take the full cycle so a robot has multiple senses and it has its proprioception and it is trying to perform an action and so you've got a trajectory which has all these aspects to it and what you do is you delete some and you try to fill them in from the rest so this is the idea which is i think the, the exact counterpart of what has been used successfully in llms and uh, uh, and so what you have is real world trajectories and the sensory motor pre training is basically the same as the gpt task and that's why we call this paper rpt robot pre training and then after that you do downstream tasks and uh, and uh, okay so these are what the trajectories look like and now how do you use it for acting you you have the sequence available up to now and you try to fill in the action at the next moment and that you then you perform that and then you try to extend it kind of in an auto regressive style and uh, and this uh, this works it works for simple tasks it will not work for very complex tasks but this is what we need to do more research for okay i think i'll uh, i i we should have some dramatic ending slide, but uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So I'm no expert in language or robotics, but just a little pushback about your thing that uh, intelligence should be, shouldn't be learned from language. So in all your examples, and I assume that that's true in general, you know, the robot is alone. He's not interacting with another robot. Whereas uh, in the language model, you could sort of think about these different agents talking to each other, understanding what the other person... So there's something about interaction uh, that requires intelligence, I guess. It, it, and, and interaction seems to be better suited to be learned through the language, at least today. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, again, I, if I had, uh, I, I deleted those slides from my talk, which is about social learning. So social learning is, is very important, okay? And uh, social learning is mediated partially through language and partially through imitation. So social just means learning from other people. And in humans, we can call this culture. But you have uh, that actually in uh, gorilla colonies as well. And families of crows, they, if one crow figures out a trick, other crows figure out that trick too by just observing. Okay, so I, I totally agree with you that social learning is a very big part of it. Social learning is probably made more efficient by language. I, I'm not, I, I don't want to go down the path of saying language is useless. Okay, that is, <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I'm certainly using language to argue that language is useless <laughs> is a self contradiction. I am I am merely objecting to the to language imperialism, which is what is uh, which is what is happening right now. I I feel that uh, language has its place. Language is uniquely human, but intelligence is not uniquely human. And so, it's it's the it's the last is the cherry on the cake or the last five percent or if you want to call it the last fifty percent. I have no objection to that. I. I, I just want to object to a theory of language, which is a theory of intelligence, which is based exclusively on language. That's what I object to. Along the um, um, uh, the questions that uh, Shafi has directed, uh, what there are a lot of approaches, for example, using um, multimodal in language. Um, so do you think there is a possibility to put um, the robotics like, as a sequential task and and get some inf more information from the language. Maybe they'll share similar patterns. Yeah, no, so so I, again, I mean, the last thing which I showed was learning from trajectories and trajectories are one dimensional just like language. So there it, it, it does feel similar. But 
the point, uh, and there is work, by the way, the, the group which has done most on this is Google. With Google has spent a lot of time in the last couple of years trying to show that uh, uh, learning robotics tasks through language. And our point was to show it, the, the language is unnecessary for that. I think language will be necessary for the later stages of sort of high level planning for communication with a human and so on. But basic motor tasks, I mean, an ape can do it perfectly well. A crow can do it perfectly well. An octopus can do it perfectly well. They don't know, need language. A sequential solving of physical problem solving tasks in the world does not need language. Language is convenient for talking to other people about it. Like we can, uh, uh, you know, uh, I can talk with Yejin about the last mammoth hunt we had three days ago, you know, displaced in space and time. Language is good for that kind of stuff. Language has value, not a language, anti-language. I'm just saying language is not the, 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 the symbol of intelligence. Response from the language imperialist corner? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, whenever Jitendra or Alyosha says um, uh, language is not as important as you think, uh, I mean, you uh, language people, <laughs> for reasons that I cannot explain, I love it. Um, but I disagree, of course. Um, I, I'm, to, to spice things up, though, I might add that uh, you, one of your Berkeley colleagues, whose name I'm not going to mention, surprised me by saying that, oh, he's so excited about LLMs because um, it uh, uh, represents the interactive behavior knowledge about the world. Like, you know, it's almost like uh, there's uh, a lot of a world knowledge baked in because it's coming from interactive data, which I think was also what Shafi was going after uh, in, in her comment. Um, uh, but, you know, I, 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 I agree and disagree, even with that in the sense that, yes, language does record the social and interactive aspects of human lives. But on the other hand, it is not the case that LLMs actually learned through interactions uh, uh, in the way that humans would have and being able to hypothesize and experiment in the way that uh, Alison Gopnik uh, was uh, pitching in her books about how children learn uh, as a scientist, as a philosopher. Um, on that note, though, because you're going so fast toward the end, I wasn't sure whether um, your exploration in this robotics space actually uh, uh, was able to touch on that experimental aspect of human child learning. Like, you know, learning uh, about the causality, no, learning of learning. No, we, we, we don't. Uh, so there is a part of it, which actually Alyosha has done this kind of work more than I have, which is that you want to have exploration without regard to a specific objective. And, uh, and then you want to record the consequences of that. And I believe in that, but the work that I showed did not have that. Uh, cool. So I guess this might be a bit galaxy brain, but... Um, I wonder, um, so you mentioned that implementing simulation environment is really important for some of these tasks. And I wonder what kind of skills do roboticists need to implement simulation environment? And I just wonder like whether at one point we can have large language models to do it. And in that way we can use an alien intelligence to help us build human intelligence faster. No, these simulation environments, uh, they are like major engineering efforts because the, the the physics is known, right? Theoretically, this is like known 200 years ago. The question is to do it fast because we need to run a billion trials. So it's an engineering problem. So the group which is currently the dominant group in this is NVIDIA because they have access to the GPU. They have access to the low level uh, sort of uh, software, uh, CUDA programmers and all the rest of it. So, uh, so there's a group led by Dieter Fox who is also at UW who who I think they like Isaac, Jim, and so on. So I, I quite like that line of work. It's, uh, I, I really, to me, it's a scientific question. How can we learn with a million trials rather than a billion trials? A billion trials will make it work in simulation. Like all our walking stuff, a billion trials, that's a good rule of thumb. Whereas for a human, we have data on like, like, uh, 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 Karen Adolf at NYU, she has actually done observations of kids learning to walk. And kids fall a lot, by the way. So it's not that they learn with 
zero trial and error. They fall a lot, but it's not a billion times. And so I just, if I can be off, improve things by a factor of three and 10 to the three, then I think we can do learning in the real world. That's to me the scientific goal. All right, let's thank Jitendra again. We now break for lunch and reconvene at 2 p.m.